Hey fellow fans, I'm Brian from BMA Comics Con, a place for comic book related conversations and connections. And I want to apologize. I'm sorry it took so long for me to share this video with you guys because what I have here is a lunch that me and a couple of other fellow fans got to have with DC co-publisher Dan DiDio. And this was made possible by the people at Coliseum of Comics, specifically the store in Altamont Springs. So for those of you who are local to the Orlando area, if you go to the Coliseum of Comics in Altamont Springs, on Wednesday, June 8th, 2016, you will get 20% off of all your DC Rebirth comic purchases. All you have to do is tweet either this or one of the other DC Rebirth videos to the at BMA Comics Con, or for those of you not on Twitter, just share either this or your favorite DC Rebirth video on Facebook and tag BMA Comics Con in it and when you go there your information will be given to them so that you will qualify for 20% off your DC Rebirth comics purchase. Now without any further ado I'm gonna get you to the lunch that we got to have with Dan DiDio. I just want to apologize it was not planned to be an interview, it was more of a lunch for us, a small group of us fellow fans, not all of us fellow fans, but I'm still going to share it with you, and I'm sorry for the little snippets that had to be cut out, but hey, Dan DiDio didn't want everyone learning some of the secrets, and man, I am sorry, but they are good secrets. <laughs> so without any further ado, I'm going to let the lunch start. Till next time, Brian out. That art was amazing. And you follow, and you that way you look at the art as a as a whole. That's what you're seeing there. Or is it? With writers, I'm looking for voice and a point of view. I need people with a point of view. You know what I mean? I, I love dialogue. That's, that's my that's yeah. My whole the, the problem with dialogue is that people get enamored with their dialogue, and that's the weakness in comics today. I hate to say this. Is there's a lot of patter, a lot of just conversation, but nothing moves the story along. Conver real winners, real winner in dialogue is somebody who's able to have strong dialogue that's able to move a conversation forward. You know what I mean? Move the story forward. Not just, yeah. not just. You know, people get enamored with the uh, conversational tone, and they, they write books as actual people speak. The problem is, if you have ever seen people do um, readings of comics out loud, everybody makes fun of it, right? Perfect. Comics aren't meant to be read out loud. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The best illustration. illustration. I, have, I, have, I have a six-year-old that I sit at home, and he when we get the comic books, uh, we sit there, and I have to read them to him. But it's so difficult. It, to it do is that. because Even with little kids' comic books, it's yeah. so tough to read. It's because hard. because it's it's being written in a way to convey information right. in a, in a not a normal speak. Right. And when you try to put normal speak into conversation into the comics, it, the, the dialogue becomes very tedious and uneventful. Yeah. You know, I mean, and. That's why when, you know, I've, everybody always hears me about the recap page, you know, well, I'm on a recap page, I don't know what's going on. I said, first of all, if you don't know what's going on in the book, then the book's failing. You know, you right. should be able to, you should want to know what's going on in the book, or understand enough, or going on, I understand you read a lot, I get it, but if you can't follow what the story's about, then the story's probably not strong. That's your first problem. Second problem is, the way comic book storytelling used to work is that you used to be able to incorporate important information that you would have put on a recap page in the course of the dialogue in the story to move the story forward you know and I never forgot I brought him I was working on a series once where I was working with an editor on a series and he brought me four issues of a, of a run of a book I read all four of those issues I sat down I looked at him I said okay you know what's wrong with this book he says I don't have a clue I said I read four issues it took me four issues to learn the names of every character in this series oh god he goes, well, people don't talk about it. You know, when I'm talking, I don't say, hey, hey, Jerm, how are you doing? Jim, what's going on, Jerm? You know, <laughs> nobody does that, but you need That's to you do learn. that. That's how you learn who these characters are. It's also, the other thing, too, is that, and this is the other part, is we also have to reinforce and search certain iconic, iconic visuals. Meaning that, you know, Superman ripping his chest or shirt open. Len Wein, again, back to Len Wein again. Len Wein taught me that when he was writing Superman, he would always have the scene where Superman rips his shirt open. 
because those are the things you recognize and know. It's, you were talking about Ninja Turtles before. You know Ninja Turtles because of the repetition of the themes and you they ingrained who those characters are. Then you can move them forward. The branding. The brand exactly. And it's just it's just the things they that identify who they are. And if you don't build that in, then the familiarity of the character is lost along the way. And that's why you can have characters appear, and if they do that one little trick that people know, you immediately know that's the character you love. You know, and if you don't do that, you don't know who it is, you know? And that's where some of these things get lost a lot of times. So it's it's there's a lot of little there's so many subtleties in writing. As I was saying before, the problem is that our staff is so spread out, there's so much product out there right now. If you look at the comic market, 400 books a month? 400? Maybe? 400 periodicals a month? Um, a lot of them. It's starting to collapse a little bit, but you're still up there way over 300. And the problem there is that staff is spread thin, talent is spread thin. You see writers writing five, six books a month right now, and I, I'm hard-pressed to believe if you do more than one book a week, you're, gonna, you're not going to do it. You know, I used to talk to writers, and I said, hey, we need these revisions. And they say, I can't get to them. I'm on my next book already. I just turned it in. I can't worry about going backwards. And I'm like, well, I don't know what to tell you, but I need you to go backwards and fix your book. And that's where you get some push me pull you that really never winds up ending well. You know? And so when you, when like you and DC in general, like look at like Image, Dark Horse, the creator owns stuff, and you're trying to find out, okay, who's going to be the next person that we want to write our books? Um, like what are the key features outside of like dialogue? The, it's, like, it, it's a, I, I really like a point of view. I like a voice. Um, I don't like things to be homogenized too much. You know, I mean, growing up, we talked about my comic collections. I was a huge Steve Gerber fan um, because I knew what I would get from a Steve Gerber book. You know, I mean, it had a point of view. I think you could say the same thing about a Scott Snyder book. You know, you're going to get a very particular voice, a personality, a certain level of prose. You know, and in either you like that or not, but I mean, if you know what you're going to get. You know, I mean, there's a certain voice, there's a certain grit to his storytelling, and you know, and sometimes you pigeonhole talent because of that. You know, we always laugh with um, with Brian Azzarello. Brian Brian Azzarello, hundred bullets. You know, you know, he walks around scowl on his face all the time. You know, <laughs> ready for action. You know, and um, then you put him and, on Wonder Woman. <laughs> he did in Wonder exactly, and he did Wonder Woman, and he did a brilliant so job. And and he went on. Then he went on. But I'm not even talking about Wonder Woman. He did this thing with Doctor 13, and I forgot it was a backup in one of our books. It was a like an eight-page backup. It's one of the lightest, sweetest things you ever read. It's one of the nicest things, one of the best things you ever read. And it's just this crazy little quirky story. Yeah, yeah. It was him and Cliff Chang working together. I forgot where I forgot where he ran it. But it was just fun stuff. And that, that was a good combo. Yeah. 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 And I mean, that's the thing too. And it's funny. And again, that's part of the other magic is finding the teams that work together. I love Cliff Chang. You know? Yeah. And, and it, him, when getting him that and rapport and, together. I was so and it's about trust because. Probably helps in the husband and wife. Yeah, it is, and it, it really is. And you want some friction there too because I think that adds the creative process that they're challenging the other in, in some ways, you know. And I think some of that's lost. I talked to some of the old creators. Old artists, you talk to Jim Lee, and Jim sits around and goes, you know, I remember I'm trying to, I'm sitting in the image room, and I'm trying to be better than every other guy there, and they're trying to be better than me, you know, and I'm like, hell yeah, that's the way it should be, competition is, is everybody wins, I used to say, and that's why, uh, well, that's why you said, oh, how do you feel when Marvel stepping up the game, I said, game on, man, this is what you want, you want everybody to be bringing the best to the table, everybody wins, you want everyone to succeed, but you want to be the number one success, yeah, that's, this. you you don't want to, yeah, yeah. Oh, always. <laughs> Dude, your friend sells 20,000 books. I'm trying to sell 35. Yeah. You know, it's like that. It's a, it's a lot of fun. You know, and, you know, but it's it's a fight. Everything's a fight. You yeah. know, it's, it's never simple. You know, and it is, and that's the other thing, too. You hire people for their will and their point of view, and then you're fighting them about their will and point of view. Right. You know? Because, <laughs> like, I'm a writer, and, yeah. like, I'm just trying you to want, get you want the that mind thing. of, like, what do publishers want. Yeah. And the really good editors, the really good editor, a really good editor, what they need to do and what they have to do is understand if there's a conflict about what somebody wants to write and what you're trying to get from and what you need the story to be, what you have to do is be able to get to the heart of what the writer really wants to say and be able to work with them 
within the confines of the box that you've created for him to tell the best story possible and still accomplish his own goal. Right. It's, it's a very delicate act. It's not about saying do this or don't do that. You know, you know, make this make this costume blue, not red. Make this thing here, but it's not that. It's not about putting down edicts. But that you need to explain the logic behind the choice so that they can understand why you're making your suggestion and you understand why they're making their suggestion. And sure. together you work at crafting something that works for everybody. Yeah. That's when you win. Like, I work at a writing studio, and with, like, our students at the university, we learn, like, there's doing, like, control and discipline, yeah. where you tell the writer, no, you need to change that, whereas, why are you doing that, exactly. and how is it going to help your overall product? And, and that's what you really want, you have to get into the logic about the choices being made, and understand them, and, and honestly, if the hardest thing to do with any editor-writer situation is, you might go in with something in your mind, what do you want it to be? They might be accomplishing the same goal, but a different way, and you have to remember what the end game is, what the end result is supposed to be, not not the journey. You know, it's like, I only, you know, because some people get so enamored with their idea or story, they don't want to see anything but that idea or story. You need that frame. Yeah, exactly, and I'm like, okay, great, but you can still accomplish the same goal and let them take it their way so that they have a greater sense of ownership and belief in what they do. Exactly. And, you know, because as soon as they become, somebody becomes disengaged in the creative process, you know, I think everything suffers. Yeah, there definitely needs to be an anchor as long as you're on yeah. the project because if you start straying away, you're going to lose readers. Yeah. Your editor's just going to be like a mess because they're going to constantly be like, hey, you need changes. And the person's like, yeah. trust me. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the hardest part. I, a lot of times, you know, you, you hear, well, uh, the edict is this is what you got to do. It came down from blah, 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 blah. You know, it's, and people might be doing that just because they don't feel like arguing. <laughs> or, or they're just trying to get to it. Or they just don't have time to argue, which is the other side yeah, of the coin. You got that deadline. And you know, I, got, I, I can't switch it right now. I got to it's, it's, it's Editing is one of the most difficult jobs out there and one of the most thankless. And next to publicity, probably. Uh, but, 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 uh, but one of the things you're doing is that you're trying to help form something. Like I said, and with all these jobs, if it works, the talent gets all the credit. If it fails, the editor gets all the blame. You know, the time, you know, just the way it works. That's the job. No, you know, no apologies. But what you want to do is be able to have that rapport with folks and the understanding be able to get across. But a lot of times when you have as much product as we're pushing, you know, when you guys working on eight monthly books or something like that, which is which is about an average workload of five to eight books that are on a monthly basis, um, you only have so much time. If this book's late, I'm just trying to get the pages out the door. Try to push it out the door, push it out the door, push it out the door. You know, and just got to get it out. Deadlines, 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 you know, because we got to put out another one after this. And uh, it's it's consuming because you're only looking stage by stage. And that's that's how you get what I was telling you before, the death by a thousand cuts. You make this compromise here. Didn't over, this thing didn't seem like that big a deal at this moment. And this thing didn't seem like that big a deal at that moment. And this thing didn't seem like a big a deal at that moment. But all of a sudden, a year later, you're off in the wilderness. You know, and I thought I was on a highway. One inch needs to two yeah, exactly. three inches and then you're a mile up again. Exactly, and it's through nobody's fault, it just happens. And that's why you get a rebirth or yeah. or a new 52. Because ultimately you're like, wow, I'm so far off that, and it's not just one book, it's a bunch of them. And I could fix one at a time, but it's like spinning plates. You know? yeah. <laughs> rebirth felt like a really good way to kind of center back the universe. Well, you know, you know what's, what the most fun about Rebirth is, is and like I said, it's really so clearly Jeff's vision. You know yeah. what I mean? He feels so strongly about it. But what I love the most about it and what I embrace the most about it is that comics have always been counterculture. That's always been its success. It's always been on the outside, working outside the realm of everything else. That's what I think is it's interesting. It's been the best criticism. You know, exactly. It's, it, it's a commentary. And the interesting part about today's society is that the overwhelming sense of negativity and conversation that's just consuming the conversation. It's the comics, too, and it's, it's like... It overwhelmed the comics. So how crazy is that hope and optimism is the counterculture? <laughs> Think about it. Yeah. Think about it. It's to say something is going to turn out all right, or that you believe in the future and the hope for the future. Yeah. Being the counter counterculture is a staggeringly difficult statement to make, especially yeah. when it's you make an indictment on everything else. You know, I think it's wonderful. Like when yeah, I went life, through life is grim. Yeah. We need to read something that's going to lighten that for exactly. us. Exactly. Even if even if you have some elements of realism in there to ground the story, it needs yep. it needs to be something positive. That you come away exactly. and you feel better than if you were watching the news because you know that's why I don't watch the news 
you have to exactly. do it to feel bad. It just makes you feel bad. Well, you want to read to be depressed. Yeah, exactly. and, that's, and, exactly. that, and that's the same thing. So that's why this, this moment, this works in such a way that I think is a great... As we call it, we keep it pulling in our lighthouse. It's a, it's the thing that we're driving for. It's our North Star. Mm-hmm. You know, we're setting this as, as, as saying, this is where we want to go. And what was great about the Rebirth book as a standalone is it really, um, it really gave us a point of saying, this is what, to all the writers, this is what we're trying to say. This is what we're trying to do. And they got it. And what's even greater about it is everybody wanted to tell that story. I didn't, we don't know what was holding everybody back. You know what I mean? And it's just, it's the perception of what people think the world wants. And now all of a sudden it's like taking the cuffs off and saying, okay, let's try to go after this. Let's go after it a big way. And uh, the level of engagement, and again, the great part with Jeff is that he's, he sat down, he met with every writer, he talked to everybody. You know, and they all, you know, and we all have that common love for comics. You know what I mean? That's the best part. Everybody, we all have that, that point, the, the beginning point. Everybody has their favorite character, their favorite story, what they love about what they do. And you take that shared bond and then you build out from there. And that's how this stuff takes off. And, you know, and, you know, it's, it's always hard to do things like this because, you know, we have, there's so many talented people out there. Like I said, there's a lot of people in the business with a lot of books and still there's still people who want to be working who aren't working there's some people who want to be here but we have to be very particular about what we do because unfortunately the way we work is that we want now we want to make sure there's consistency in our characters so you're always wanting to bring new voices in and new sensibilities and new ideas and it's it's, it's just it's always a it's always a tough 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 road to walk but we have a, we have a lot of confidence in, in where this is going right now and there's a lot of time like i said we we started building Rebirth back in October. Uh, I was explaining the story about how I went to a convention and the level of disinterest in DC material. It was the first convention I'd done in a couple of years. And the level of disinterest in DC material was, was actually like a bucket of cold water thrown in my face. It was, uh, it was staggering, you know, and, um, and, and very disconcerting and frightening in some way because I'm afraid, like I said, that's why I said, I'm afraid everybody's just going to go to a TV show and a movie and forget about the comics. I'm going to get my superhero fix by doing that. And the superhero fix has got to come from the comics or else, or else we're out of business. So um, so that's why, and we should be the leaders. And I still feel very strongly that we should be the leaders of all this. You know, it should be our voices, you know, setting the tone for what everybody else does. So, so it's kind of, it feels, it feels like we're getting back to where we need to be again. No. You. no, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, hey, listen, we listen. You know what? My most, in the 14 years I've been in DC, the most successful period of time for me at DC has been the launch of the 52. It was our biggest hit, biggest success. Still is. Yeah. Uh, but Rebirth is coming. Rebirth seems like it's. It's coming up there. Yeah. I'm very happy to say that the Rebirth numbers are matching the new 52 numbers, which for me is better than we expected it to do because just because. You know, we the level of skepticism that we had heard, I thought we might have hold things back, but this was a full company effort to try to get this back on track and get the get the retailers excited, get the fans excited. Doing that live streaming event at WonderCon was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. You know, it was something we fought hard to pull together. Uh, WonderCon people were great working with us on it. Um, you could feel the excitement. Yeah, like but, it was, young, but also, and it was good so because it was a lot of times a lot of those creators met for the first time there. You know, yeah. a lot of new people, with different groups there coming together, and everybody felt like they were part of something special. And I think that energy carried over to the half of making the books. You know, so that actually brings me to a question. The teams per book, how did those teams come about? Oh, that came. Everybody had a hand in it. Some, a lot of them were handpicked by the editors. Uh, some of them were suggested by Jim, Jack, and myself. Um, it was really a full team effort. You know, we have. You know, while we we bring some of the writers in to talk, you know, we we sit in editorial groups every every week, just kicking things around. Who's available? Who's not available? You know, who likes what character? Who doesn't like what character? Who wants to do what? Who has an idea who has a pitch. Like I mean, my you perfect example is Josh Williamson. It's my oh, favorite story. I was in San Diego Comic Con last I'm year right. with Josh Williamson. And Josh Williamson comes up to me, gives me this big, hard pitch on Flash. Clearly pins me in a corner in a booth. <laughs> to the point I can't get out of here. So it's like, so he like, pins me in a corner in the booth, right? And gives me this whole pitch. And I'm like, no, it, it's okay, not even here's all the things. What would you pitch? I go away. You know? <laughs> face with really nice guy. Oh, yeah. uh, so he goes away, yeah. comes back. And he yeah. took everything I said seriously and comes with all these fixes. And I'm like, okay, that's actually a pretty good story now. But you still have a couple of things off. 
and he goes away again. So, and then we think about rebirth, and we're like, okay, where we start? I'm like, you know, Josh Williams has been pitching, <laughs> and he's got a really good story for Flash. And then Jeff goes, okay, let me hear because just very proprietary of Flash, as we can see in rebirth. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so they sat together and just like, okay, now this story, and they took it from here. Boom, and they brought it up to here. And all of a sudden I go, I got a flashback, you know? Yeah. And that's how that came about. You know, and it's just that becomes a passion. I mean, even with Rob Venditti, you know, he's like, I still have a story that I need to tell. And I said, what story's got to tell? And he says, okay. And I'm like, okay, that sounds great, but we're going to do it over here. And so, like, it all started to come together. You know what I mean? You felt it building together. We we wanted Tomasi on Superman. We, we loved the heart that he brought to the Batman and Robin book. And we thought the one thing we really wanted to bring Superman was that level of heart and caring again. And uh, I don't know if you read the, the Final Days of Superman storyline, but I honestly, he just did a beautiful job building that thing. Just a beautiful job. I love that book. Yeah. I thought uh, Tomasi and Gleason were wonderful. Yeah. Back Those guys, you know, it's funny. It's it's so weird because it just shows you how weird this is. How the relationships evolve. Uh -huh. You know, Pete was Gleason's editor when Gleason was the artist on Aquaman during the Sub Diego days. You know, and uh, you know, the way, you know, and they develop a poor understanding. You know, you know, even for the little bit of writing I do, there's a couple of guys I just love working with. I love working with Philip Dan. I love working with Keith Giffen. You know, just the, this. It, takes the work out of work. It's just fun. Because yeah. they like really built up like just that relationship between Damien and Bruce and Alfred yep. and everything. And it just yeah. felt like a really good like yeah. Batman story. You know, it yeah. brought me back to like reading Morrison. Yeah. 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 Well, the Morrison one, I mean, the Morrison one, what's so brilliant about the Morrison run is that he had that story no. figured out I'm excited from the beginning to end. He knew exactly how that thing was going to play. He pitched yeah, us the end of Damien's death scene probably the first year he did the book. Grand? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Literally. From And you think about it, he took over that book right after the one year later jump. I think it was right after the one year later jump. Might have been then. Maybe? Does that sound right? I don't know. I'm trusting you. I have. Uh, don't do yeah, My you memory's the worst. My mem <laughs> I am, uh, I, I'll just say with authority, I have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> oh, I hated him the day I read that. What? I was like, no. He, he had that in mind from the moment he introduced David he always knew that story, he always knew that ending was coming through so he was always working to it planning it laying it out so distinctly and just incredible it's really it's just an amazing run we, we never thought he would be on Batman and I said we put every roadblock in the way for him we did the one year later jump we do new 52 launch he's changing titles we're changing everything and he stayed tried and true and just and just a little gangbusters how do you know? Peter and um, Patrick like kind of react when Grant was like, "All right, let's kill Damien." No, we, it, we. The thing is that they always knew it was going to happen. Oh, okay. So since we knew that it was always part of the story, they knew it was part of the story. So it didn't it didn't pull the rug out. It made everybody prepare for it. But like when they did, like yeah. kind of learn, like yeah. this, this happened. Probably they found out before they jumped onto Batman. And they probably, they must have known it beforehand. You know, that's a, it was a long time ago. I figured that's 19, I'm sorry, no, 2000, <laughs> 19, it's just, yeah, sorry, 2000, 2000, 2006, 2007, yeah. when Grant takes over, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because that's like around the time of the two. Yeah. Uh, what? I hate I hate, you know what I really hate? I hate people working for me that were born in the 1900s. <laughs> uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you watch that, okay? <laughs> I can search on my birth certificate if you need it, Dan, I promise. <laughs> what team and what book are you most excited for? Do you think would be the best? No, what are you most excited for with Reading? It's hard. It's hard to say. I, I, I know what concept I'm most excited for. Because I like I most, the concept I like the best is uh, is Super Sons. Oh my god, yes! Oh my god, yes! I, I'm so that excited is, for that. That is, that is without a nice. doubt, my pride and joy. It's my pride and joy. It's gonna be hilarious. I can, uh, I, 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 I can say this because it's, it's a funny story. So anyway, so. I always tell you about, I always say about what things people hate. Paul Levitt's hated Super Sons. <laughs> and I've been trying to do Super Sons for a while. Paul hated Super Sons. How did the pitch go? What? How did the pitch go? No, I, we, I never got, that one does never got to the pitch stage, but. <laughs> oh my gosh. You just did it like, oh yeah, we're doing this. And you know, and Grant, and Grant had some fun with Super Sons in, in Multiversity, the concept behind it. Right. But as I always say, I always tell people, I say, you know, DC did in World's Finest the old Super Sons. I, I, I apologize for looking at you when I was looking at the old stuff. <laughs> I'm 52. 52. Okay, there you go. Okay. That's the only reason why you're at that table. I, I, I read those issues when I came out. Oh, you came out? I bought them all too. 
So I, I have. So anyway, so I have all. Of them. And by the way, they're not good stories. That's why Paul hated them. They're terrible stories. <laughs> but they're so endearing and lovable. There's something fun about the son of Superman and Batman complaining about their super dads. Just something great about it. So all of a sudden, we have this weird opportunity where we actually really do have the son of Batman and the son of Superman <laughs> appearing in our continuity. I'm like, holy crap, we can do Super Saiyan. This is cool. We can do Super <laughs> Are you just like so excited at that point <laughs> yeah. when you realize it? Yeah, we can do Super Sons. And, <laughs> and, uh, and then they, I started seeing some of the designs and I'm like, holy God, this is gorgeous. And uh, I think the book's going to be fun and it literally is. And we went at it as, as Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. <laughs> You know what I mean? So he went at it as it's you know it's two kids on adventures. Is you know naming going to be Tom? It, it's weird because <laughs> oh, the, the switch on this and the switch on it is a good one. Is that the troublemaker is actually Superboy, Jonathan Kent. We as the way the way Dan Jurgis created the character, he said this is as low as the sun more than it is Clark's son. Okay. So he's well, more inquisitive. Oh, he's more troublesome. He's Just always jumping into in things, general. curious, going into it. And Damien's trying to be authoritative and in charge. This is and my he's team. Pulling him, and he's pulling him into everything I, I in the world. I can't wait for Teen Titans. When I read that, when you I heard read the story? his point of view yeah. on each one of the characters, I'm like, oh, you little. Yeah, and that's I and, but that's what made Gotham Gotham great. Academy. That was, I, I, I can't wait for those. Yeah. We, when, when Grant I first when Grant first wrote Damien, he always described him to me as the little prince. You know, he's he's like uh, he's he's the, he's the little king. He's, you know, yeah. he's, he has, he's regal, he's royal, he's you know what I mean. And yeah. He doesn't understand why. Just because I'm ten years old, I don't understand why anybody's not taking me seriously. Oh, his first interactions with Alfred just yeah. proved it. Yeah. So whenever Harley and the Joker have their child, is that going to be the new villain? I think they're probably the new villain. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord, that's <laughs> well, we'll save that for the next right. game. Okay. <laughs> we'll save that for the next game. I'm game. trying to imagine the uh, the Harley Childbirth special right. one. Yes. Who's gonna write oh, that? Right. Oh my God! Amanda would be perfect. Well, you know, do you know what Amanda did, don't you? We so I do a joke. So I, I, this this is my fault. It's all my fault. My fault, 100. percent So I'm joking. We got rebirth going on, and we're talking about. Oh, I don't think we need a Harley Quinn rebirth. She's sort of just what it is right now. Because the rebirth issues, the books that have not every book launching has a rebirth issue. Right. The only books that have a rebirth issue are ones that needed enough of an adjustment that we felt we wanted to do a call out in this issue before the series started. We had to give her an extra issue, didn't you? And then you guys you gave her she's, she's got another story come at it too. No, no, she's uh, she's got the little Starfire. The little by book. No, no, we don't come. So we didn't do a Harley Quinn re we didn't do a Harley Quinn rebirth because we thought yeah, nothing changed there, it's working just fine. So so but I, I was joking with Jimmy and Amanda. I'm saying, yeah, but if we don't do Holly Quinn Rebirth, we could do Always Cool Holly Quinn Afterbirth. You know, so that was the joke. <laughs> Seemed funny at the time. At the time. At the time. So um, I, I say that, and I um, I'm, she drew it. I'm, <laughs> she drew it. Oh, she drew it. Yeah, no one made it. Was it safe for work or no? What? Was it safe for work or no? Yeah, I do. Listen, so that would be the most awesome thing to get. So it's yeah, it's so they, so it's so I'm sitting at my desk, and then the uh, the editor of Holly Quinn's in my doorway. And he's like, I'm like, what's the matter? He goes, Did you ask for this? And I'm like, <laughs> Yeah, you did. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, this art just came, this sketch, this is a cover they're turning in. I said, I'm sorry, what are you doing? It's a shot of Harley Quinn, feet up in stirrups. <laughs> At least she's proactive about it. Amanda was ready. <laughs> and the doctor's holding the cover to Harley Quinn number one in front of her. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, it's brilliant. We can never. Ever publish this? <laughs> Please take it away. Are we sure we can't? Because I would probably People buy would it. Buy it. <laughs> People would buy it. Yeah. There's, a a variant. Buy it. There's a variant. There's a variant. You know what you do? You just bag it like a sex criminal variant, and you're good. Yeah. Oh god. I refuse to open any of my sex criminal variants. I want to keep the bag for a bit. Oh my god. All right, I opened it and then I like tried to stuff it back in the bag. It was great, it wasn't. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, and that's why we won't do that cover. Anyway, yeah, that's okay. No, no, that's why you buy just two. Just get ahead of the price yeah, I know, this listen. time and say, hey, it's a variant. You yeah. don't need to buy yeah. it. I mean, the last time I got into that type of discussion with her yeah. was during the scratch and sniff issue of Harley Quinn. Did you get that? I did not get that yes. one. I, I didn't that. think I saw that one. Oh, you did? Yeah, we did a, we did a scratch and sniff issue of Harley Quinn. What was that one? It was unique. Do I just need to Google this? Yeah. 
Christmas tree. It was a yeah. There was a. It was a Christmas one. Like oh yeah, it wasn't. It was. It was one. Yeah. The, the Christmas two. tree was the Canadian there's one. Two. Yeah, the that Canadian. was an issue. Yeah. Yes. I have it. I have both issues. No, 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 I have it, but I mean, that was you like a that. public issue. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, yeah what oh, happened? an issue for them? Yeah. Oh, yeah, no. Did that blow up, blow up on you? No, no, what happened was, uh, what happened on that one was that one of the smells was, was marijuana. marijuana. Yeah. Right, so, yeah. So, what happened was that we couldn't, we were told we weren't allowed to bring the book over the border because they were afraid that the smell would create problems or they were afraid that <laughs> I didn't think it was really that and, and they said it, that because if something sniffed out the smell and even though it was just you know something yeah. that was in there if it was picked up across the border it could have frozen the entire shipment of comics coming oh in from the printer <laughs> so we actually had to, to ship them separately than everything else so <laughs> So we actually had to print the scratchy stiff cot smell that. ones in the US. And that's why we only had them in the US, because they couldn't bring them across the border. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know about this one issue. Was like, <laughs> I like this. It was, it was I can't wait to find it. The Christmas? Yeah, it was just. Christmas. We're being silly then. We're much more serious about our comic sounds. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Super just, Sons, just like for sure. Just like <laughs> Super Sons is just a hoot now. hell. I, I, I just, I, I, really love, I really love it to death. You know, it's just one of those things. When World's Finest came out and it was the Dodgers, yeah. or, well, not really the Dodgers, yeah. but Supergirl and Punisher, yeah. so I was like, this is going to be fun. Yeah. But then Super Sons come out, like, this is going to be really fun. Yeah, because it's just, they're going to, they're going to, we, the, the, the theme I said when, when we're working out the book is that the tonality should be the Goonies. The kids, crazy fun together, but real danger around it. You know what I mean? So real threat that they go into. This is going to be the more intense Gotham yeah, yeah, Academy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. a little bit, yeah. Because Gotham Academy, there's a sweetness to that yeah. that you don't want to disrupt. But this will be more in Action, line of a regular comic book. So, yeah. That's kind of a good idea. A Goonies type. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? That's, it's kind of, it's kind of fun for that. So they're working on that right now. So we'll see how it comes back. It'll be good. Oh, we're not allowed to talk about that at the table. He's got a camera on me. <laughs> <laughs> Turn it off. If he shut that off, I could tell you all about Justice Society. But you missed your chance. Huh? When we were doing Infinite Crisis, the original, the original lineup for Infinite Crisis, we actually had five miniseries going into Infinite Crisis. And this is when this tells you when. So it was it was Omega oh, Project, Vengeance, uh, Day of uh, Day of Vengeance, uh, Rant Out of Our War, and Villains United. And the fifth one was Amazon's Attack, which is the original conceit. And the story was that at that point in continuity, Paradise Island was disappeared, right? And the story was going to come back where Paradise Islands came back and landed 90 miles off the coast of Washington, D.C. Oh. <laughs> and ultimately, they were, we had a whole storyline where we're going to send in weapons inspectors to Paradise Island. And the, the Amazons were going to fight them off. They wanted nobody on their island. Everybody hears about all this super technology on the island. So they set up a flotilla around the island and the Amazons. And then what happens is that Superboy Prime, in the background, blows up one of the U.S. ships. And the U.S. ships open fire on Paradise Island. And then the Amazons attack Washington, D.C. <laughs> that was the big story. That was Amazon's attack, the original Amazon's attack. So we have it all laid out, ready to go. Because again, it was it was one of these stories. It was about the whole concepts of Infinite Crisis. There is original title, but it's not really a word. That's why it's not the original title anymore. It was Infinite Crisis. This is meaning multiple. It was about where where Crisis on Infinite Earths was about multiple Earths collapsing into one. Infinite Crisis was about multiple crises occurring at the same time, splitting the superheroes up to not sure where their focus was, and then thinking that everybody's been spread out, but then you find out that there's a single cause behind them all. So all the different crises have a single foe, so everybody's spread out, and then they realize they're all fighting the same person, and they all join up and fight the same person. Um, so anyway, we had this whole Amazon tax going on. It's, I forgot during the period of time we're talking about now, 2003, 2004, um, Gulf War is going on, and uh, ultimately we um, were asked not to do something to put U.S. soldiers in peril in our storytelling, or make them look like the bad guys. So we actually collapsed the story and pulled it out. In hindsight, that worked out fine because there was a there was a better balance to the four miniseries leading into one than five. You know, they would have been tripping over each other a little bit more, but. That was a story that we were really into, and it had some real grist to it. And um, ultimately, though, this is when you, know, you don't let go of an idea. So 
Later on, we were talking about trying to do another event, and we always had Amazon's attack that was pulled out, a story that was built, and we sort of handed it over to another team, and it just didn't take hold. It didn't take hold. Um, so, it, um, so that was a shame. I mean, the only other time that other happened with me is that uh, we were actually working with George R. R. Martin, and George R. R. Martin created the story Salvation Run. Uh, originally created the original story in charge. This is a funny story. So, <laughs> so George and his co-writer were working on turn, you know, had kind of the picture of Salvation Run is the idea of sending all our villains to another dimension of the world, sort of like an interdimensional Australia. And and it was and it was a really actually it was originally an Elseworld story. A prison planet. A prison planet. It was an Elseworld story that should have stayed an Elseworld story, but we tried to make it into continuity. That was the first mistake. Um, then what happened ultimately was um, so he turns to this first script, possibly the most violent comic I've ever read in my entire life. Not surprisingly, if you see Game of Thrones, brilliant, but violent as hell. So we had to pull back, and then we tried to do it again, but it was much more watered down, and it lost all the visceral impact because this storyline was an all-encompassing one, one that started with these villains off on another planet and ultimately staying there through their through generations. And you watch the generational growth of how a society based on villains evolves. You know. Which is a really great story, and again, in hindsight, we probably should have stayed the cost instead of trying to make it fit into the uh, continuity. But that, you know, you, know, you make mistakes. You make mistakes. At that point, we were trying to build the world, and we we're looking for big stories to build the world. And again, when we did it, when we did the run-up to Infinite Crisis, we laid out a two-year map of what the story was, so we knew how every beat was going to unfold. And every quarter we set up a major moment. You know, Blue Beetle gets killed, you know. Max Lord gets killed by Wonder Woman. The Watchtower blows up. The, the heroes from Crisis of Infinite Earths return. Everything, you know what I mean? So you knew what you were working towards. So you were, the way the story, I always call it an oscillating universe. So the universe is spread out. Everybody's telling their story. We have a common point. Everybody works at the common point. And then you get to the common point and you see how that affects everybody. And you go out to your own stories again come back in, you go back out. And that way, every short book has a chance to breathe, but it also feels like it's in a shared world. Um, and that's why it worked out so well from Countdown to Infinite Crisis all the way through to 52. It's pretty much thought out. Um, and then when we came out of that, when we did Final Crisis and all that, we had multiple trains running on different tracks and with the hope that you'd be able to bring them all together and you never hooked up. Exactly right. So. You were struggling, you know, so you, and then you get into that rhythm where you have to hit a number, you have to sell a certain number of books, you got to get things out the door, you know, when you're starting to do things that are just sensationalism for the same sake of sensationalism, and that's how you get off track. It's when you start concentrating more on something other than the storytelling. Exactly. It's like, now I have to hit a number, not like, what are we trying to tell? That's why with Rebirth, we went back to the countdown mythology. We said, okay, we got a plan. Here's a two-year plan. Here's a two-year idea. This is where it's going. A lot of things still to be figured out, but we know the momentum. We know the beats. We know what is coming. Now we just got to figure out where they fall. And that's a little bit easier because then you can see how every series and story is looking. And you say, okay, this guy can work on this over here. Or do a little bit of that over there. or Do a little bit more over there. And then we can build up to a crescendo down the road. So this is the rebirth, do you have an ending already planned out? I wouldn't. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm looking at this guy over here. <laughs> um, keep telling us stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Um, I have a question. So, what is your plan to stay on track? Because the reason for rebirth was, you know, little inches, things come up, you understand, but you don't realize you're off track until you're way off track. And some of the, one of your plans was, okay, we're going to condense the amount of books that are out. But of course, things are going to happen to where side stories need to happen. Yep. What are you planning to do to make sure you don't end up with well, too many titles? Well, we, we're not. As a matter of fact, I mean, we have already built into our minds break points in our schedule where if a double ship's not working, we can slow it down for monthly. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of books that can replace, but we won't do one-for-one -one replacement. Um, but the goal is to... It's all about it's all about pre-production. We're spending... I have more people focused on prepping things in advance than it is about just catching up to them. You know, we're getting up to it, getting information as it comes in. And that's, that's the hard part to maintain on a regular basis. But... It's it's communicate. It always everything we do comes down to communication. You know, 
making sure that everybody's talking to you, everybody's aware. This meeting set up on a regular basis. Jeff talks to the editors once Not a week. Too much free, uh, free, uh, free, uh, creative freedom. Not yeah. Too much. Listen, you know what? I always Creative Freedom is a great story. My favorite story about Creative Freedom is David Lynch and Twin Peaks. Right. Okay? Favorite story. Um, I was at ABC at the time. Twin Peaks comes on the air. Everybody knew David Lynch was eccentric in his approach, but brilliant in a lot of things he does. Right? Yeah. What? <laughs> that, exactly, right. So they said, we're going to do a TV show, but these are the confines of how you work a television show. This is the box. You're working in a box. Right? He, so he builds this, and he's inside that box, and he's pushing at every wall, you know, to make, you know, to make it fit what he wants to do, you know, rather than just to perform. He's fighting against the box, but the box holds steady, but he's getting what he wants to. He's elbowing it out and fighting it out. So he sees it comes out, critical, rating success, popular beyond belief, everybody's talking about everything. The second episode, second season comes on, do whatever you want, we trust you now. And the show went, poof. In every direction, right? Every direction. It became harder to follow. You're, you're losing your threads, and the reality is that box made the show a better show, I think. And sometimes the box is better because the real a lot of great creativity comes from challenging the box. <laughs> you know what I mean? Challenging the parameters you put on you. It's like, God damn it, I want to tell a story, and I'm going to tell the story I want. And if that's what they're putting me on, I'm going to find a way to make my story still work regardless of what they say. It's that infamous, fuck you. <laughs> it is. It's that you accentuate every sentence when I'm being creative. Fuck you, I'm going to make this work better than you think it can be. That's where I'm going to be. That angry, you know? And uh, it's passion. It is, it is. And you want that fire. You want that passion. You want that belief because the more passionate somebody becomes, the more you, you root for them. You know what I mean? You know, I remember I was one time when I was working in animation and... You know, I was a new guy there, and I was giving notes to people who were desperate to get a show picked up. And I was giving notes, and they were agreeing with every single note I gave. And I said to him, at one point I said, are you agreeing with me just just because you want your show picked up, or are you agreeing because you agree with the notes? Oh, no, we agree with your notes, with your notes. I'm like, okay, great. So I gave two or three more notes, and I said, wait a minute, did you agree with me saying you agreed with me giving your notes? <laughs> just because you wanted your show picked up. And you could tell that... That, that, that desire just to please, just to get it done, and compromise, might be compromising what you believe in it in doing so, you want people to fight back. You want that. You know, you you're not, you're not, you don't want to create a situation where it's antagonistic every day, but you do want some level of confrontation because it brings clarity in the, uh, in the discussion about what people's point of view are and what they're trying to say and the best way to say it. And you want someone confident about their own Oh, yeah, work. you always do. The more confident they are, the more you can step back. The more, yeah. It's that sense of ownership. Who owns the book? We always talk about it. Who owns the book? Does the editor own the book? Does the writer own the book? Everybody owns a piece of it. The real win is everybody walks away thinking good. that they got their story. You know what I mean? I've sat in rooms where, you know, I four people in the room and everybody walked away thinking, this is the story I created, this is the story I wanted, and everybody firmly believes that. And I'm like, you know, because you always... You, and that's the hard part in the bigger picture. When you hear the old stories about the guys creating comics, who created what character, I can guarantee you everybody's right. You know? Guarantee you everybody's right. Because everybody's in that room to create something. And when that thing is finished at the end of the day, you have that sense of ownership, you feel you created it. Because you have that pride in what you created. So, you know, that's the crazy part of all this. You know? And, you know, but that's the win. That's the win. You know, that's what it is. It's a collaborative medium. That's the one thing everybody's got to remember. It's collaborative. It's art and pictures. You know, and and we sit here talking about the writers all the time. I can't even tell, express about how important the artist is. You know, head and shoulders. We always say, great art saves bad story. You know, great story don't save bad art. You know, <laughs> and that's just reality. And people pick up a book. You're going to see the art. And if you love it, I'm going to read it. I'm going to buy it. If I look at it, don't want to look at it, I'm going to put it back. And if, but if I pick it up and I look at it and I love it, I take it home. It's a great story. I'm coming back. That's where you win. <laughs> going back to Route World, I don't think I would have enjoyed it if there was a different artist. Yeah, the, the, that's a, that was my favorite part of the New 52. If I got the big omnibus, the New 52 omnibus. You look at that omnibus. It is beautiful. Cover to cover, every book explodes off the pages. You know, we we had a lot of heat from all the costume changes, but. There was some vibrancy to the costume changes and the and the artists on this and the new interpretations and new visuals that just took took head and shoulders above everything else. 
like you know? the new costumes. That was that yeah. was never a problem. I mean, it's yeah, it is, and like I said, it's just it really listen. We can be, there's you have to approach. We talk about believing yourself. But belief in yourself also breeds arrogance. Yeah. You know, and arrogance breed, breeds isolation. You know, you only listen to the people you want to listen to. You need we're to know what you're passionate about. We, we were joking about that. this. We were joking about this on the way over here. I was talking about reviews. I said, you know, I really don't read much online. You know, and you know, and he said, oh, you should read it now. Everything's positive. I said, well, that doesn't seem right. I said because well, I don't believe it when it's wrong. Why would I believe it when it's right? You know, so I have to believe in the objective sense of the numbers or our own personal belief in what we think we're trying to accomplish. You know, and that's an important part of what we do. You know, but um, I love you know the energy of the creation. You know, the, the challenge of it. Yeah. You know, that's where I know, from the fun part. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm rambling. I guess we should roll. You already paid the bill, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, Tim. <laughs>